Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is January 10, 2022. I hate to come back with more really terrible news about the COVID pandemic, but that's what we've got. We've got really bad, terrible news. This is a really pressing situation. It seems like the U.S. government has basically just given up even trying to do anything. Uh, I'm seeing different reports on how many COVID cases were reported newly today in the U.S., one source said 1.1 million, another said 1.4 million new cases reported today. And yeah, there's some weekend backlog in there and whatever, but that's a lot of cases. It's also more than last week. So clearly the Omicron surge is just continuing to spike. And indeed, that's exactly what we would expect. When you don't even try to control transmission, cases go up. You don't control a virus by letting it spread. That's just not how it works. So Biden is basically running herd immunity plus vaccines to take off some of the edge. But what we know about COVID is that the so-called natural immunity, it wanes just like everything else. And it's also not perfect, just like the vaccine coverage is good. Get the vaccine unless your healthcare provider specifically tells you not to. And even if they do, get a second opinion unless it's for a really good reason. You want that extra protection because these viruses, this isn't the flu. It gets into your brain. It affects your blood clotting. It affects all kinds of things. It hits your liver, your heart, your kidneys, your lungs. We don't even know fully all the damage that it causes in the body, but what we do know is really alarming. This is not a disease you want to mess around with. If you want to know more about long COVID, check out the tail end of the last video about COVID that I put up about a week or so ago. I read an entire medical summary of long COVID. It is alarming. It is serious. And again, you don't control transmission by not controlling transmission. You don't get the disease under control by letting everybody get it because you can get it multiple times. It's not going to go away if you do that. It's just going to keep circulating and circulating and circulating, and it mutates every time it reproduces. Most of the time, when a bacterium or a virus mutates, it's not a big deal. It's not necessarily advantageous to the virus or to the bacteria, whatever. It's just sort of a change. But if you do it enough, you keep rolling those dice, you let it reproduce and reproduce, well, you're just taking a chance every single time that you do that the thing is going to wind up with an advantageous mutation, which is going to make it attack us more successfully. You don't want that. But again, the U.S. government completely throwing its hands up, and now we're over a million cases in a day, and there's no end in sight. They're predicting that if things go the way that they are, uh, we're probably going to hit 3 million cases a day or close to it in February. And there's no reason why we wouldn't. There is no reason why we wouldn't. Hospitalizations are at a record. I read 133,000 or thereabout today in the U.S. Um, we need immediate action. This means mask mandates. So, for example, if 80% of people uh, were to wear masks consistently, which you can definitely achieve with a mask mandate, you could cut the number of daily cases in half by doing that, by just stopping the transmission it's really important to do this. Also, we know that COVID is airborne. It can travel as aerosol particles. This is different from droplets because droplets are bigger and they're more subject to gravity. They're going to fly out of your mouth and then down. Aerosols don't. They stay suspended in the air for much longer periods of time. And so you can breathe them in. And so you need a mask that forms a seal around your mouth and nose, like an N95. So I've said all this in previous videos, but it's enraging uh, I think this is 10 days later after the last video. Situation is dramatically worse. Dramatically worse. Now, people need testing. Let's talk for a minute about why you don't want to leave things like this up to capitalist for profit enterprises. We have a story here. This is out of the New York Times. The headline is Maker of Popular COVID Test Told Factory to Destroy Inventory. One of the leading producers of rapid tests purged supplies and laid off workers as sales dwindled. Weeks later, the U.S. is facing a surge in infections with diminished capacity. So basically, this story says that last summer, uh, when you know 
Biden was announcing back to normal and everybody take your masks off and all this. This was before the big Delta surge. They were like, hey, we're making all these uh, COVID tests and, you know, oh, it looks like the pandemic's winding down. Maybe we don't need them, whatever. Uh, we're going to read this article in a minute. But basically the idea here is, I mean, I don't blame this business individually because, yeah, they have to do what's profitable. That's the mandate to a business. If it's not profitable, you can't do it because you just only have so much money and they need to maximize their profits. That's why you can't keep running this system for critical functions. I mean, as socialists, when there's a socialist revolution, one of the first things that they do is take over critical infrastructure and take it off the market, stop running it for profit. This is electricity, this is transportation, communications, and healthcare. You can't run this on a for-profit basis because for-profit industries have a certain logic to them. And like this, you know, if it costs them too much money to store tests that they may not need, they're going to dump them. Okay. If you don't run it on a for-profit basis, but you're producing these things for the good of society and the public interest to meet human need, then you don't have to use that calculus. So let's get into this article. This is by Sherry Fink, and it was published back in August, August 20, 2021. And then it was updated September 29, 2021. So article says, for weeks in June and July, workers at a Maine factory, that's Maine the state, M-A-I-N-E, factory, making one of America's most popular rapid tests for COVID-19, were given a task that shocked them. Take apart millions of the products they had worked so hard to create and stuff them into garbage bags. Soon afterward, Andy Wilkinson, a site manager for Abbott Laboratories, the manufacturer, stood before rows of employees to announce layoffs. The company canceled contracts with suppliers and shuttered the only other plant making the test in Illinois, dismissing a workforce of 2,000. The numbers are going down, he told the workers of the demand for testing, saying it wasn't their fault. This is all about money. Comment, and that's what I was saying. You can't have vital things like this being, quote, all about money. As virus cases in the U.S. plummeted this spring, so did Abbott's COVID testing sales. But now, amid a new surge in infections, steps the company took to eliminate stock and wind down manufacturing are proving untimely, hobbling efforts to expand screening as the highly contagious Delta variant rages across the country. So comment, they were writing this back, you know, in August, September, when the Delta curve was starting to take off. This was even prior to Omicron. It was already a problem by that point. So continuing, demand for the 15-minute antigen test, Binax Now, is soaring again as people return to schools and offices. Yet Abbott has reportedly told thousands of newly interested companies that it cannot equip their testing programs in the near future. CVS, Rite Aid, and Walgreens locations, these are all drug stores for people not familiar. By the way, Maine is a state way up in the north by Canada, northeast United States. All right, now that we've caught everyone not from the United States up, continuing, CVS, Rite Aid, and Walgreens locations have been selling out of the at-home version, and Amazon shows shipping delays of up to three weeks. Abbott is scrambling to hire back hundreds of workers. The USA was notoriously slow in rolling out testing in the early days of the pandemic, and the story of the Abbott tests is a microcosm of the larger challenges of ensuring that the private sector can deliver the tools needed to fight public health crises, both before they happen and during the twists and turns of an actual event. Quote, Businesses crave certainty, and pandemics don't lend certainty to demand, said Stephen S. Tang, chief executive of Orishore Technologies, which in the midst of the testing slump in June received emergency FDA authorization for its own rapid test, IntelliSwab, long in development. But the company is not yet supplying retail stores. Meanwhile, Dr. Sean Parsons, chief executive of Elume, or Elume, the Australian manufacturer of a competitor rapid test, said this week that demand was 1,000 times what it had forecast, and that it was racing to set up a U.S. plant. Abbott's decisions have ramifications even beyond the United States. Employees in Maine, many of them immigrants from African countries, 
were upset at having to discard what might have been donated. Other countries probably could have used the materials, according to Dr. Sergio Carmona, chief medical officer of FIND, a nonprofit that promotes access to diagnostics. So comment, I said before that I don't blame them. I do blame them for that. Continuing, quote, This makes me feel sick, he said of the destruction, noting that more than a dozen African nations have no domestic funds to buy COVID tests. In an interview, Robert B. Ford, Abbott's chief executive, argued that the discarded materials, finished test cards, should not be viewed as tests. Kits for sale also include swabs, liquid buffer, and instructions. Comment, okay, but these were sort of vital ingredients, so <laughs> continuing. Quote, I would just caution in terms of using the word destroy, because it kind of gives a sense here that we've got all these tests that were in packages, and we threw them away, he added. Asked why the materials needed to be thrown away, Mr. Ford cited a limited shelf life. But photographs, taken in June and July, of some of the estimated 8.6 million Abbott test cards employees said were shredded show expiration dates more than seven months away. 8.6 million cards with expiration dates months, sometimes up to seven months away, were shredded. Workers had their own conjectures. Some figured layoffs were imminent and there would be no employees left to dispose of the excess. So in other words, the company wanted to destroy the stuff even though it had time left because they didn't want to keep the employees on so long. They wanted to shred them while they had the labor power to shred them, even though they still had plenty of time left in terms of being usable. Continuing. While others thought the company did not want to flood the market and decrease the value of its product, a box of two home tests carries a retail price of 20 to $24. So another comment there, we're going to do three stories in this video, and another one is about the price. But this general principle of capitalists destroying their own product to keep prices high, you see this all the time. They will dump milk in the sewers to keep prices high. They don't want to flood the market. And hey, you know, everybody gets milk, but, you know, it's too cheap. And the anyway, this is why we should not run most things for profit and eventually have to move away from that completely. The system just does not allow, capitalism does not allow for things to be done in the public interest. Again, where there is profit concerned, the capitalists are up against competition from other capitalists. If they break the logic of the profit mandate, somebody else is going to come and push them out of the market. They're going to lose their competitive position. So that's why we have to take this entire system down, because everybody who participates in that system becomes subject to these laws. This kind of predatory competition just does not allow for more than a certain amount of deviation from the baseline. And we know that this does not serve society. So yeah, you can see it. Uh, I remember, I think it was at the beginning of the pandemic, actually, showing like mountains of potatoes. You know, potatoes, people could eat. They are filling. They have calories. They're a good base for adding other ingredients to. They were just dumping them to keep prices high. In a country with a lot of food insecurity. I'm talking about the United States. All right, anyway, continuing. As for donating Binax now, it is a U.S. product that it is not registered internationally, Mr. Ford said. Quote, we couldn't just ship it there. But he acknowledged that the company did, in fact, send a million tests to India in May paid for by the U.S. government. Okay. Dr. Mariangela Batista Galvao Sameo, an assistant director general at the World Health Organization, said the agency was not made aware of the Binax Now surplus. While some countries might have had regulatory barriers, the WHO, quote, would have worked to facilitate whatever is needed. Donating tests would probably have required considerable extra work for Abbott, she added. Comment. So again, capitalist enterprises are concerned with what is profitable. They have to do a lot of extra work, and it would be easier and cheaper for them to just shred the things while they have the workers that they have. Then that's probably what they're going to do. This is just how capitalism works. And again, this is why socialists need to organize independently for political power, achieve political power, and suppress capitalism. Continuing. 
addressing the challenges ahead in the U.S., Abbott's public affairs director, Ali Morici, said in an email that it was, quote, difficult to scale up on a dime, but we're doing so again. She acknowledged that, quote, there will be some supply constraints over the coming weeks. Abbott invited workers back to the plant in Maine this month to meet what it described in a letter as, quote, unexpected manufacturing needs, but it is unclear how many employees will return. They would forgo weeks of being paid for doing no work, as provided for in their severance packages, with only a two-week thank-you pay extension and no guarantee that their jobs will last. The company was not in this position in early 2020, anticipating the need for quick, reliable tests that required no specialized equipment, Abbott assembled a team of about 100 scientists, supply chain experts, and engineers to design Binax Now in a highly compressed time frame. The company took risks, importing expensive equipment and opening two U.S. factories. Quote, Everybody was working nonstop, Mr. Ford said. This is ultimately what Abbott was built for. Comment. What Abbott actually was built for, which is what all capitalist enterprises are built for, is turning a profit. If they don't do this, well, there's a phrase in there. that The company took risks. Yeah. It's all about that personal risk. So, actually, somebody asked me in the comments recently, what do you say to pro-capitalist, you know, capitalism supporters who say that, you know, it's a system of risks and rewards and whatever else? Well, what I say to that is we don't need to pinpoint these like massive spikes of risk and these massive spikes of reward onto individual people. You can distribute the risks across society. You can socialize the risk and you can also socialize the reward. That's kind of what we're trying to do. You don't just let one individual because, first of all, most capitalists get ruined. They enter the market. They try to do something profitable and it does not pan out and they lay out a bunch of money and resources for a particular enterprise, and it doesn't work out. That's a very common scenario. So that risk doesn't need to be that way. You can distribute that risk where it's not falling on individuals. And then likewise with the reward. You don't need to be rewarding a few people like they're kings of the universe. You can distribute the rewards across society as well. So we don't need to be doing this. And again, the only kind of people who really do this are people chasing profits. That's a really poor basis for running society. Because then even the enterprises that do succeed, I mean, what kind of behavior do they have to engage in to stay profitable? Well, see the last video, Wage, Labor, and Capital by Marx for some you know, greater breakdown of that. Continuing, the test strip resembling the one on a pregnancy stick is less sensitive than a PCR test, but it delivers results on the spot allowing a company or school to take immediate action. The FDA granted Binax Now emergency authorization last August. So comment, that means that the product hasn't gone through the normal amount of testing, but it's being authorized for use anyway on an emergency basis. And yeah, the pandemic certainly is an emergency. A day later, the U.S. government announced plans to buy 150 million of the tests for $760 million. $5 a test, plus shipping, to be used in settings including nursing homes and schools. Friendship Public Charter School in Washington received 20,000 government-purchased Binax Now tests free of charge as part of a pilot program supported by the Rockefeller Foundation. Comment, there's a lot going on in that sentence between the charter schools and the Rockefeller (laughs) Foundation. I'm going to leave that one alone right now. Continuing, Patricia A. Brentley, the school's chief executive, said that 70% of students' parents opted in for them to get swabbed once a week. Quote, Testing is still an important part of the strategy not only to reopen schools, but to keep them open, Ms. Brantley said. Comment. And remember, this is back in the fall when they were thinking about, you know, reopening schools again. Now they're just like, oh yeah, a million cases a day? Who cares? You know, (laughs) it's total insanity. People are getting injured and killed because of it. Um, you know, I don't know, not to get off on that again, but it's a travesty. Continuing, Northwestern University also adopted Binax Now early, testing students twice a week. The university performed up to 5,000 rapid tests a day 
according to Luke Figora, the school's vice president for operations. After the FDA authorized Binax Now for at-home use, Northwestern bought 150,000 kits, handing them out to students, faculty, and staff. Quote, we wanted to give them one more tool to stay safe, Mr. Figora said. Abbott met its initial production goals by keeping manufacturing lines running 24 hours a day and emphasizing speed to an extent that some employees said made them uncomfortable. Comment, and of course worker input, not a default feature of capitalism. On a January conference call, investors learned that the hard work was paying off. Abbott had sold $2.4 billion in coronavirus tests, mostly rapid ones, in the final quarter of 2020. Quote, I expect testing demand is still going to remain high, even as the vaccines roll out, Mr. Ford said on the call. Quote, the big point here is the sustainability. For a while, it appeared he would be right. In March, the federal government announced $10 billion to support testing in schools. By April, Abbott had reaped another $2.2 billion in testing sales. The same month, the FDA extended Binax Now's shelf life, originally six months, to a year. But then the CDC came out with a game-changing announcement. Vaccinated people without symptoms no longer needed to be tested, even after exposure. Comment. This was like stage one of the current situation where basically, I mean, I'm reading things about people with a 102 fever being called into work in hospital emergency rooms. That's where we're at now. The CDC has just been slashing the expectations of, you know, working sick. I mean, I've worked in food service before. There's a lot of things you can't do <laughs> working around food in terms of people being sick and whatnot. And uh, in medical settings, though, apparently anything goes. Uh, I was reading about something. Somebody got sick from the COVID positive nurse that was administering a COVID test to them. So like you go in to get your COVID test, the nurse administering your test gives you fucking COVID. Like, think about it. This is where we're at. This is not a sign of U.S. economic resiliency. This is a sign of both capitalism's basic inhumanity, but also U.S. economic desperation. They're making people work sick with COVID in medical settings as long as they're not, like, coughing up blood. That's basically, like, the guidelines at this point. I'm exaggerating slightly for comedic effect, but not by a lot. Again, go watch the last CDC video. And in fact, we're going to, that's the third article that we're covering in this video, is about the CDC's insane and cruel and inhumane and injurious new policies and the virtually incomprehensible messaging around them. So, continuing. Quote, We couldn't have anticipated what has occurred over the past several weeks, Mr. Ford told investors on another call, describing, quote, a sharp and rapid decline in demand, particularly for rapid tests, and dropping the company's earnings forecast. Abbott later announced a $500 million restructuring plan. Quote, Are you not thinking that there's going to be any kind of, you know, resurgence or ramp up of screening testing in the fall? Matt Taylor, a managing director at UBS, that's a multinational investor based out of Switzerland. Somebody was asking me in the Kazakhstan video if I could name other nefarious uh, financial institutions other than the World Bank and IMF, the International Monetary Fund. I mean, these investment groups, there's BlackRock, there's all kinds of things that are deeply intertwined with vital functions that countries need to carry out their basic things. Like, look at, in this case, COVID testing, and you got some Swiss multinational with their fingers in it influencing things. I mean, this is not even the tip of the iceberg. The, I mean, I would not be able to draw you a map of like how all the financing of things in the world works. I'm just, I'm not specialized in that area. But the basic premise of global capitalism is that super rich assholes fund everything and pull the strings. And that's basically what you find. All right, continuing. Quote, what are you going to do with all the capacity that you've built up? The destruction that followed lasted about a month. A list of, quote, lots to be destroyed appeared on a whiteboard at the plant in Westbrook, Maine, 
and some of those had recently been labeled with new expiration dates. So, that's what I got for you out of that article. Now we're going to switch to another one about tests. The headline here is Walmart, Kroger. These are, I mean, Walmart's like a huge retailer. They do everything, including groceries. Kroger is also like a grocery chain in the United States. Raise at-home COVID test price after White House agreement expires. The companies agreed in September to sell the test kits at cost for three months. This was published January 4, 2022, NBC. So in the previous article, we looked at fuckery and manipulation and the failings of capitalism at the manufacturing side. Now let's turn to the middleman, the retailers, who have been jacking up COVID rapid test pricing. I mean, again, this is the United States. We've highlighted many times, just to take one example, the UK, you can walk in on any given day and get seven COVID tests. You can get them delivered to your house, from what I understand. In the U.S., we have to pay, well, we were having to pay $10 each, each, not seven for $10, each one for $10. Uh, now they're raising the prices to like $20, $25. If you want the really accurate one where you swab and send it into a lab, that's been $100 to $125. Now, that's for the at-home version. You can go out and get swabbed for free at a healthcare facility, although in the midst of a surge like Omicron, going anywhere is probably a bad idea. So having these things available in at-home versions would really be sound policy, make a lot of sense. Instead, what do we see? The agreement with the White House expired recently, and there's just kind of a void. So let's get into the article. This is by Tim Stello, dated January 4, updated January 5, 2022. Walmart and Kroger raised the price of Abbott's at-home COVID-19 test kit after an agreement with the White House to sell the tests at a reduced price expired, the company said Tuesday. The Binax Now kit, one of the first at-home tests to be authorized by the federal government, was listed on Walmart's website Tuesday for $19.88 up from $14 last month. Kroger listed the tests for $23.99. President Joe Biden announced the agreement with Walmart, Amazon, and Kroger in September, saying it was part of his administration's plan to ramp up testing and, quote, better detect and control. <laughs> oh, man. If only they knew. The coronavirus variant that then posed the greatest danger, Delta, comment because remember there was a really big delta spike in the fall continuing the three-month agreement to sell the tests at cost expired last month just as the new omicron variant began advancing quickly across the u.s comment so i don't know what definition of at cost they're using here exactly but i believe that they said in the last article that the government had been buying these tests for five dollars each I guess Walmart has another $9 of costs built in there somewhere. Again, why we don't want to leave these things up to a for-profit system. But anyway, other than that, you know, at cost means that whoever's selling them is not marking them up, isn't making a profit. But that seems very strange. Anyway, continuing. A spokeswoman said in an email Tuesday that unlike other retailers, Walmart continued selling the product for $14 through the holidays. Quote, we have seen significant demand for at-home COVID-19 testing kits and are working closely with our suppliers to meet this demand and get the needed product to our customers, she said, adding that inventory has remained stronger in stores than online. Comment, probably because nobody wants to go out right now. Continuing, the kits, which include two tests each, were listed as sold out on the Walmart and Kroger websites Tuesday. In a statement, Kroger said it had fulfilled its commitment to the Biden administration and had reinstated, quote, retail pricing. Amazon did not immediately respond to a request for comment. The tests were not available on its website Tuesday. The White House could not be reached for comment. Of course, they have better things to do, like not managing the pandemic. Biden said last month that the administration plans to ship as many as 500 million free test kits to people who request them through a website, a plan that experts have said will require significant scaling up. Comment, 
And as we've covered in two previous videos, there are 330 million people in the United States. Assuming 80 million don't want the test, that leaves 250 million. That's two tests per person. Congrats. You got them a week's worth of test. All right. Administration officials have said that they expect the first batch to ship sometime this month. So that's the end of that article. Let's move on to the third article. This one's about the CDC, and I swear to God, oh, we covered this extensively in the last video. The pandemic may just be beginning. Let me just say how deeply unimpressed, even just sarcastically as a comedic understatement, does not cut it. How about every PhD in epidemiology, every master of public health, every doctor of public health, everyone with an MS in biology, or anything relating to medicine, nursing, any field like that, who has signed off on any of these policies, has their credentials revoked for contributing to the social murder of hundreds of thousands of people during this pandemic. This is totally inexcusable. And to have people, let me put it this way, if I know with my level of education that, like, I've been able to predict a lot of these things. <laughs> If I'm able to do that with my level of education in biology, believe me, they know what's going to happen. And, you know, Democrats are the party of science. We're the party of science. We believe in science. Except that when it comes time to please the capitalists, whom the Democratic Party exists to serve, when it comes time to please them, when they come calling, the science goes right in the fireplace. It's never heard from again just like the Republican Party. In fact, you know, this is a bit moot because the entire political situation in the United States is completely untenable, and it's not going to last, and something has to give, and working people have to organize independently of the Democratic Party for political power. We need to build up power so that we can refuse unsafe conditions like this, and eventually take power from the capitalists. And in that process, the fundamental task at this stage of the U.S. left, is to decouple completely from the Democratic Party and with all capitalist parties. That is a prerequisite. You're never going to build the kind of power we need inside the Democratic Party. But anyway, my own feeling is I feel like the Democrats, it's a better overall political situation. Again, with the caveat that the overall situation is untenable and not sustainable. But I feel like we get better results almost uh, overall when the Democrats are in opposition and they have to pretend to be fighting with the Republicans. And they have to try to convince their liberal base that it's going to be different, just put us in power again. Now, again, we need to build socialist independent power so that when the Democrats are in power, there's still somebody actually, you know, an organized force calling them out. And eventually we need to do more than call them out. We need to completely take power away from the capitalist class as a whole. That's the Democrats and all of the other servants of capitalists within the political sphere. But anyway, Rochelle Walensky is a great example of somebody who, when she wasn't in power, uh, was a decent COVID warrior, was actually good on the policy. Then you put her in power as CDC director, and she just dances to the tune that they give to her. I mean, that's She's following the marching orders coming down from on high. She is not in control. So anyway, here's an article from MSNBC. Headline, the CDC's new isolation guidelines are a communications disaster. This is from January 3rd by Hayes Brown, MSNBC opinion columnist. Tagline is, the Omicron variant surge feels like a bad time to confuse people. Now, we covered this at the end of the last video on covid Basically, the CDC says meme, and there were some hilarious ones in there. Uh, personally, I liked the CDC says you can go ahead and find love on Craigslist, although it's a tie with the CDC says you can now wipe back to front. Anyway, that's funny, but there's nothing funny about the situation, as in the reality on the ground, as in record pediatric hospitalizations, etc. And I wish I could say they're dragging their feet. I don't know what they're doing. And apparently this MSNBC utter normie, like, this is as mainstream as it gets. They don't get it either. So let's read the article. Last week, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention introduced new guidelines that reduce the amount of time people who test positive for COVID-19 but have no symptoms 
should spend in isolation from 10 days to 5 days. As a result, it feels like everyone in the country is mad at the CDC. I'm normally inclined to defend institutions, but I can't blame the folks baffled by the CDC's decision-making process. Since the pandemic started, the non-frontline job I've envied least belongs to those communicating the CDC's decisions. Comment, this actually doesn't need to be a hard thing. Um, If they were actually, quote, following the science at every stage, this really wouldn't have been so bad if they hadn't flip-flopped on masks and other stuff. They were The problem is, I think, that they were seeing what they could get away with, like how little they could do and get away with it. And that was their basic mistake. They're making it now. And the really disastrous part about now is they're not correcting what is obviously a gigantic mistake. To be clear, we need a national N95 mask mandate. We need shutdowns yesterday. We need Medicare for all, obviously, and anything else incidental to the pandemic, like adequate testing, you know, what we've been talking about in this whole video, as well as figuring out the hazard pay. Uh, you know, they didn't raise the minimum wage. There's where are the monthly checks, like that whole thing. It's like we just went through two years of a pandemic, getting invaluable lessons from all these experiences the last two years. And it's like they're just throwing them out the window as if they've learned absolutely nothing and expecting somehow to get not the utterly predictable results you get when you let a highly infectious virus just rampantly spread. You get one outcome, massive outbreak, wide contagion. That's what you get. That's what you get. If I know that, they know that. And they're letting it happen. Where does this end? Because it ends somewhere. You've got schools with 50% of the kids not showing up. I mean, this is going to end somewhere. All right, continuing. It's a hard, thankless role, referring to those communicating the CDC's policies, and one that they somehow have not gotten better at as the pandemic has dragged on. Comment, again, not to rant again, but... I think it's more than that. They made disastrous decisions in 2021 when they said that vaccinated people could take their masks off. I mean, that was basically a shotgun blast to the head in terms of the pandemic recovery plan. Back in April and March, when we still had shutdowns and mask mandates and things like that in place and there were monthly payments and different things, we still needed to be doing more but you had vaccines plus all that stuff. That made some amount of sense. When you then take out the mask mandates and you end all the distancing precautions and all that stuff, that for me was when the balance tipped to heading towards disaster. And of course it doesn't hit all at once. You know, it's a process that starts and then it builds on its own time. But if you understand the spread of disease at all, This isn't uh, surprising, you know. Anyway, continuing. But for for me, this is the heart of it. This is really the heart of it. They knew goddamn well what was going to happen. And here we are. It happened. All right. Actually continuing. The new guidance suggests that if you're showing no symptoms after five days in isolation, you can go out in public as long as you wear a mask for another five days. But there's no requirement that people test themselves before they leave isolation. Comment. Two things there. You wear a mat. Well, actually three. So they cut it from 10 days to five. Why? (laughs) Walensky said in a video, well, you know, people didn't want to follow the 10 days. Okay, tough shit. It's a pandemic. You don't, like, pretend that (laughs) your public health decisions are still evidence-based because you caved to the holdouts in your population. That doesn't make any sense. So reducing it from 10 to 5, that didn't make sense. Then, as long as you wear a mask, what kind of mask? We know that cloth masks don't really do much. Uh, If you have cloth masks stockpiled, wear a surgical mask underneath it, and then wear the cloth mask over it. That will give better protection. But really, you want an N95. Personally, I think the N95s are better than the KN95s. Every KN95 I've used, and maybe I've just been using the wrong kinds, 
They don't form as good of a seal, in my opinion. And that's due, I think, to the ear loops that usually the KN95s have versus the head straps that the N95s have. Anyway, for me, it's N95 all the way. And, you know, they make soft ones now. You don't have to get the hard shells. They're much more comfortable. You can wear them for hours. It's not an issue. Anyway, but there's nothing about that. And then the thing about people testing themselves before they leave isolation, they keep considering this and then not doing it. In the UK, for example, for one example, you have to have two negative tests before you leave isolation. And listening to Walensky try to justify this, it's like you can see it on her face. She knows what she's saying is nonsense. So along those lines, let's continue. In their attempts to defend the new guidelines, exactly the subject we're talking about, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, the CDC's director, and Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, actually helped to undercut whatever support there was for those changes among people who take COVID seriously. Walensky told CNN on Wednesday that the change, quote, really had a lot to do with what we thought people would be able to tolerate. That's what I'm talking about. They cut down their recommendations below what's actually indicated by medical science to just basically placate the holdouts. Fauci, meanwhile, said, quote, If you are asymptomatic and you are infected, we want people to get back to jobs, particularly those with essential jobs, to keep our society running smoothly, unquote. Well, how's that working out? I see, according to covidtracker.com, that one in six of all cases of COVID that have happened during the pandemic happened in the last month. So you've just got people working sick, spreading it. That might work for a few weeks, but it's not going to work for a few months. And then where will we be? Did you think about it? Like, what's the plan? Continuing. On their face, both are reasonable statements. I would beg to differ. We're already at a point where many Americans still refuse to take under advisement even the most basic recommendations, including vaccination and masking. Comment. You do not leave things like that up to individual motivation. You just cannot run an effective public health strategy. And I'm going to talk about the masking, okay? Vaccination, this is something that has always been required, I mean, at least in modern history, for schools and things like that. It's, I mean, also for healthcare workers and in other areas. That is not really something brand new for COVID. But let's leave the vaccine mandates aside for a moment. I want to talk about mask mandates because that's where most of the transmission is happening. Vaccines, it can cut down on transmission a little bit because your body attacks the virus more quickly, getting your viral load down a little bit faster and making you less contagious at least after the first few days. But really masking, that's the aerosols coming out of your mouth. That's what we're trying to get to the root of. And we haven't had a mask mandate in what has it been, like eight months? Well, that's on the CDC. You can't leave that up to individual initiative. People just won't do it. A lot of people are not super well educated in health affairs. And if the CDC is not requiring it, then they think it's optional. If it's important enough to make the recommendation, make it a requirement. This is a once in a century disease outbreak. Let's act like it. Moving on. And as Walensky told the Today Show, most people already weren't complying with the 10-day isolation period. Comment. So is that an enforcement issue or is that a you're setting the bar too high issue? It's an enforcement issue. And they didn't even try. They didn't even try to correct it. There's also the risk that with the Omicron variant quickly spreading, a 10-day isolation period would force too many people to stay home and lead to the shutdown of vital services. Quote, on balance, if you look at the safety of the public and the need to have society not disrupted, this was a good choice, Fauci told NBC Nightly News. So again, as I said before, that might work for a few weeks. It's not going to work for a few months. Also, you're not taking care of the people you're sending out some of them to their death, even the vaccinated ones, in this situation. You're running a back-to-normal strategy, which clearly is not effective. Clearly is not effective. We're at like a million cases a day right now. Again, go back to last spring, 
people had the vaccine option, and they were also protected with required public health measures like a mask mandate, etc. Yes, it was a reduced version of normal. Yes, maybe you had to wait a little longer to get stuff. But you could be more confident that you weren't going to get infected. And that confidence is non-existent at this point. They threw it out the window. They threw it away. So there are ways to not have your society get disrupted by this. But this is not a, quote, good choice for getting that outcome. I agree. We do need to have things work, at least at a minimum emergency situation level. But that means supplying the people doing the work with the things that they actually need to stay safe. And I don't think we were doing enough before. We needed to do more than that. But they're not even doing what we were doing last year. And if it was just going to bite the Democrats in the ass politically, who cares? Who cares about the Democrats? The problem is, it's not just them they're taking down with them. It's all of us. It's all of us getting COVID. It's all of us living in the fear of getting COVID. It's all of us living with the fear of a vulnerable family member getting COVID or a non-family member loved one getting COVID. And these are well-founded fears because even if you don't die from COVID, there's a good chance of ending up with at least a temporary disability, including an up to brain damage. These are things we don't fully understand yet. We just know that long COVID is a thing. And these are not reasonable risks to be asking people to take two years into a pandemic when we should know a lot better. And we do know better. They're just not following the science. It's time for business to just go back to what it was. It's not working. Look out your window. It isn't working. Record hospitalizations. It isn't working. Continuing with the article. But by incorporating societal responses and employer requirements into their arguments, Walensky and Fauci implied, <laughs> yeah, that the CDC's decision wasn't based purely in science. You think? While the evidence shows that people are most contagious during the early days of their infection, health experts say there's no new data that justify changing the guidelines. Experts have also raised concerns that the new guidance doesn't include a testing requirement and leaves it up to individuals to presume that they're not infectious. Comment. I don't know how many stories I've read from other people on Twitter relating their employment experiences of working sick with COVID. Why would anyone want to go to a business or a restaurant or even get healthcare procedures when it's very likely that they're going to be exposed to COVID by the people serving them. It requires a level of complicity in denial that I don't know that that's going to hold up super long either in the face of very obvious symptoms of COVID, particularly in people over 50. I mean, people with any kind of com other disease, comorbidity, uh, and, you know, being overweight, um, all kinds of things. I mean, you can basically, if you're not in perfect, perfect health, or if you're slightly over the midline in terms of age, let alone if you have a more serious, you know, existing di disease or disability, uh, you're at much greater risk of getting the worse health outcomes of COVID if you get it. It doesn't mean you're going to get the worst outcomes. It means that you're at greater risk of it. So, you know, the more people <laughs> like that come down with uh, COVID, this just isn't going to hold up. Continuing, that brings us to the biggest problem Walensky and her staff face trying to explain their thinking. The gig is one of inherent contradictions. People respond well to clear, concise instructions. Easy to remember slogans, bullet point checklists, things that would look good on a poster. But by its very nature, there is no real certainty in the middle of a pandemic. The government's public health officials are constantly learning new things, dealing with new variants, and revising previous recommendations. This has meant any proclamation from authorities has been required to be issued with a pretty substantial set of buts and ifs and other hedges. But if there's one thing Americans really seem to hate, it's a caveat. Let me pause there. We have not learned new things really in like a year. I mean, like, in, term, in terms of anything that would fundamentally change any policy. 
The big change that they made was in May, where they said, if you're vaccinated, mask off is fine. That was, like I said, I think one of the biggest missteps that they made in the entire course of this thing. There, there have been many. I mean, denying people benefits for five months in late 2020 to try to make Trump look bad in the election. Yeah, that was also a gigantic, gigantic problem. Uh, but telling people to take masks off, it virtually guaranteed we were going to have another. Well, because you get people used to not wearing masks. They're like, oh, good. Phew, that's over. That is the last thing you want people to think when you're talking about mass psychology and a public health response that, you know, has been difficult and people have not been that compliant. You want people going in one direction and you do not want to issue countermanding instructions until you're absolutely sure and they were not what they were was willing to take a risk so that biden could look good and declare mission accomplished pandemic over he wanted 70 percent of people in the u.s vaccinated by the fourth of july that didn't happen i think we were at 50 percent something like that maybe it was even lower on the fourth of july needless to say though they still declared it mission accomplished anyway and then along came delta Okay, congrats. You defeated the first iteration of the virus, the original variant. You defeated that. Great. Yeah, the vaccines pretty much took care of it. But you didn't beat Delta. And so that kind of mixed messaging, it was purely political. It was, you know, for economic reasons, which, of course, these go hand in hand. We're living in the dictatorship of capital. Capital controls the government. The government exists to maintain and expand capitalism and... That's what it was about. It was about selling this idea of like, everybody go shopping again. Everybody spend your tourist money this summer. Everybody do all the things that capitalism needs you to do. They took a gigantic risk on something that was not likely to pan out. And of course it did not pan out. And so this is really is less of a thing of like, oh, well, we learned new things and it complicated the advice. No, we didn't really learn anything that should have substantially changed anybody's approach until this thing was really done. And it was not really done. The last thing that we saw was that Delta was mounting a huge, huge wave uh, at the end of the summer into the fall. So yeah, I think less about Americans seeming to hate a caveat and just, you know, more political risk-taking for the sake of the economy. Continuing. That struggle has been clear since the early days when Fauci and others were advising against people purchasing N95 masks and other protective equipment in short supply at the time. The goal was to save that inventory for frontline medical workers, but it was used as ammo to discredit the later recommendations that all Americans wear masks indoors. The initial message was clear, but subsequently shifting from it led to greater mistrust. Comment. I think that they're spinning that in an overly rosy light. I think that they were trying to get away with having to advise people to wear masks and alarming people in that way. Uh, I don't remember this being clear at that time. I mean, I do remember eventually it was like, well, the healthcare workers need the N95s. I think we all probably remember pictures of like hospital staff wearing garbage bags because like they were running out of other PPE. But anyway, on this subject of greater mistrust and trust in general, gee, it's almost like people rightly don't believe a fucking word the United States government says. Because it's constantly lying us into wars and lying to us while it's robbing the Social Security Trust Fund and everything else that they do. Why would anyone trust the U.S. government? Think about it. You have an institution that lies to you all day long for self-serving reasons that just benefit the class at the helm of the government, the capitalist class, which is a tiny minority of the population, and they treat the rest of us with extreme fear and suspicion. They treat us all like we're terrorists for existing. And then we have a situation, this virus breaks out, which actually requires society-wide cooperation. Well, the contradictions within the capitalist system kind of make that one difficult because you have one very wealthy, tiny minority interest, which is at 180 degrees opposition, antagonistic interests, with the vast majority of the population. You can't have full society participation when you have that kind of 
conflict of interest within the classes in your society. What's good for capitalists is bad for workers. What's good for workers is bad for capitalists. This is the way that capitalism is set up necessarily. So when you have a natural disaster like a virus that requires everyone to get on the same page, well, that conflict, that contradiction is highlighted dramatically, and that is what we're seeing. Trying to finish out the article here, we're on the last page finally. The country's health leaders promise that they incorporated a number of factors into their decision. I believe them on that front. Yeah, they factored in what does Citibank want and what does Goldman Sachs want. So yeah, a number of factors. Continuing, did they consider how those guidelines will be abused to make people who are sick with COVID report to work because they are unable to find a rapid test to prove that they have COVID? Yeah, I have doubts. In the most recent polling available from the Annenberg Public Policy Center of the University of Pennsylvania and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, a majority of Americans still trust the CDC. But when Gallup polled Americans in August on whether the CDC was, quote, communicating a clear plan, the results weren't great. 41% disagreed with the premise, and only 32% agreed that the CDC was communicating a clear plan. That was equal to the previous low point in Gallup's polling since July 2020. I'd be interested in seeing Gallup's results after the latest guidance shift, because the feeling of confusion and betrayal from people who think that the CDC is prioritizing businesses over saving lives is palpable. Comment, it's getting too obvious, rein it in. On social media, Americans are having fun with finishing the thought, the CDC says, dot, dot, dot. General rule of thumb, if your policy is perplexing enough, or just bad enough, to inspire a meme format, you've made a mistake along the way. So that is the end of that article. By contrast, I know I said that we were going to do three articles. Here's just a peek at a fourth. Here's a headline, January 16, 2021. Yeah, it's a year ago. Just be aware, but, you know, this was also the height of the pandemic at that time. China builds hospital in five days after surge in virus cases by Joe McDonald at the AP. Five days. The article says the hospital is one of six with a total of 6,500 rooms, 6,500 rooms, being built in Nangong, south of Beijing, in Hebei province, the official Xinhua news agency said. In five days, they built one of six hospitals with over 6,000 rooms. Why? Because there was a surge in virus cases. China is setting a much better example of some of the things that are possible when you harness industry in the interest of the average working person. Meanwhile, compare that, and you can look up video of this. Just go into YouTube, type like China builds hospital in 10 days or 5 days or whatever. You can see this process. It's how China's been able to keep their cases and their deaths as incredibly low as they have. It's because they actually deal with it. Now contrast this with like, oh, we're going to destroy the tests because the warehouse space, it's uh, too expensive to store them. And I got to think about the bottom line. Okay, Mr. Capitalist, you go ahead and chuck them because you got to do your thing. And uh, I guess we're all fucked, but, you know, profits, I understand. So we don't have to be in the situation that we're in in the United States. We're in this situation because the capitalists run this country. We're in this situation because the class that rules the United States is only interested in their own interests, which are the interests of a tiny, wealthy minority whose material interests are diametrically opposed to the vast majority of the working population. Literally, our loss is their gain, their loss is our gain. You know, if you go back to the beginning of the pandemic, when they did the shutdown in March and April... That was the only time that the stock market went down and housing prices went down and stuff like that. That's what they're trying, I think, to forestall. They're trying to just keep the line going up forever. That's untenable. First of all, I mean, things like housing prices, these need to come down. They're completely unaffordable. And literally, they have found that when they don't do the shutdown and they don't do the proper response, it's actually good for the stock market. Like, yes, 
sacrificing working people's lives literally seems to make the line go up. Now, we had this under Trump. We have it under Biden. Both, you know, those amazing two options that we get in this capitalist political system. Do you want these capitalists or these capitalists? Well, now we've tried them both. Is one worse than the other? I don't know that that's a meaningful question at this point. Neither one of them has done what we have needed. Now, let me give you a predictive statement. If the working people of the United States do not organize independently for political power and through those working class organizations pursue various forms of class struggle till we find forms that are effective at different points in time and are able to build enough power and numbers to refuse unsafe work conditions and anything else that we want to refuse and build political power, then this will go on forever. Do you want that? Because I don't. I really don't. I can't imagine why anyone would. I think that people, A, don't know what to do, and then B, if they figure out what to do, are afraid to do it. That's what I think is going on. But let's be clear, it is not in the interests of the people who run this country and who have pretty much a lock right now on every lever of power. It's not in their interest to fix any of this. So if we want to get our hands on those levers of power and control the industry that makes all the stuff that we need and make our own system of politics and government that actually enables the working class to represent ourselves in life without giving more and more power to parasite capitalists day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. There's one thing to do. Organize into socialist parties, find something that works, form coalitions, form alliances, and fight. Find the methods of struggle that work in whatever given situation we're facing and fight the battles that make sense to fight in pursuit of the overall strategy of breaking capitalist power to do this kind of shit domestically and then all the stuff that they do internationally on a foreign policy basis. We need to break their power. And I'm going to say right now, we're nowhere close to doing that. The sentiment is getting there. We had movements like the anti-war movement in the 2000s, the Occupy movement in the early 2010s, the Bernie movement more recently. People are fed up. They need more agitation and need more education and definitely need more organization. But the sentiment is getting there. It is growing. But as mere sentiment, it does nothing. It has to be turned into organized, concerted mass action that is coordinated for political and economic gains. We talked before about how if you don't do certain things in the presence of the virus, COVID-19, you can expect certain outcomes. Like if you don't have mask mandates, you can expect people won't wear enough masks to significantly stop spread. And you can expect X amount of people to get infected in a certain amount of time. And you can then make reasonable predictions from there. Well, same thing with capitalism. If working people do not unite and pursue political power through various kinds of class struggle in a variety of organizations working in coalition with each other, then the capitalists who already have power will just keep doing what they're doing. They're not going to stop. It's just like the virus. It'll just keep doing what it's doing. Capitalists will keep profiting. We will keep multiplying their capital. We will keep contributing to their wealth in exchange for subsistence, while they hold all the political strings, they control the military, they control every lever of power, their system will have crises, and then they'll just reorganize it, and they'll keep doing the same thing over and over again, while millions of us get hurt in the process. That is what you can expect if the working people of the United States do not get organized and fight and stick in the fight consistently for power. Like the virus, capitalism has a very simple internal logic. It can be opposed, but if it is not opposed, it just continues leaving its trail of destruction. So who will oppose it? Is it going to be people inside the Democratic Party that is funded and owned by the capitalist class? No, it is not. Is it going to be by people in the media, which is owned and controlled by the 1%? No, it is not. 
it's up to us, the working people of the United States, to join and form organizations and fight for our interests. And you're never going to get the approval of the capitalist media. They will write endless hit pieces about us, where they even cover us at all. And in fact, if they ever do write something positive, be wary. Because when they finally start praising us, it's because they're scared. And the praise is meant to diffuse the tension and the anger that's driving us in pursuit of our suppressed interests. You got to push on through that. All right, I'm going to leave it there. I think that's enough food for thought for one video. If you are terrified of what's going on, you're not alone. I was just reading a tweet. Somebody said, is anybody still feeling pandemic fatigue? Because all I feel is fucking terrified. I got to say, I had that exact same feeling today. Like, I just don't feel anything about this pandemic but fear at this point. Because we're two years in, it's worse than ever, and they're literally just rolling up any... They're like, we never, we never had a shutdown. What do you even talk... You, you imagined that. So anyway, this is a really difficult time. I, I mean, people I've talked to in my life... Definitely this thing has taken its toll on people. It's like people are, the whole situation is kind of in free fall. So if you're freaked out about that, that's a normal response. It means that you're not in denial of what's going on. But, uh, you know, do keep in touch with friends and things and, you know, reach out. And again, see what organizations are active in your area. Um, let me do the closing now because I often give that pitch, actually always now at the end of every video. So... Thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. Patreon.com slash socialism for all if you want to make a donation and get a credit. But otherwise, back in the real world, join an organization. Uh, I really recommend joining something larger, although if you really feel called to something smaller that you want to help build, go for it. Um, just be aware, you know, being in a small left org can be... Um, you know, a very high ratio of frustrating kind of getting off the ground stuff compared to actual work. Uh, if you want to just get out there and get active on something, you know, just see what's going on in your area. There's going to be different things that different people are drawn to, but please do it. I mean, you know, things that you do online, it's great. You know, like the video, subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends, leave a comment, even if it's a good video or thanks, that helps to boost the channel. And yeah, this channel has been growing and that's great because more and more people are getting educated about the actual history of people fighting back against capitalism. And, you know, the history of socialism, it's a history of working people fighting for ourselves. It's sloppy. It's messy. Like, there's a lot of mistakes. If you've ever been a member of a left organization, I mean, what is it? It's working people making a working class living. And on top of all the stuff you're dealing with in your life, you're also trying to wage a fight for political power. It's tough and it's frustrating. And socialist movements that have actually had revolutions are no different. They're people. They're working people. That's who drives a socialist movement. So yeah, I mean, it's messy and we make mistakes, but it's a hell of a lot better than letting capitalists just rule over us. I mean, thinking that they're somehow not A, making mistakes, or B, running a system which literally does not prioritize our lives. So yeah, being in an organization, it's messy. You're going to have to fight with other people. You're also going to have great moments of collaboration and cooperation with people. But I mean, it's got to be done. Otherwise, the status quo is just going to roll on and on and on. And I think that we're all past the point where that's an acceptable option. So I'm going to leave it there. Thanks again for listening. We'll catch you in the next video. And seriously, this is, I think, the worst month of the pandemic since it started. So if you're freaked out, hang on. This too shall pass, but it is also calling us, I think, to rethink uh, just what we're doing politically and everything, because this really is a very high pressure, very high stress moment. Hang in there. Reach out to somebody if you feel like you need help. If you feel like you have help to give, then see who you can help. As a very famous philosopher activist once said, from each according to their ability, and to each according to their need. Let's figure it out, and let's try to get a hold on the situation with minimal damage. More audiobooks and other commentaries coming soon. Again, until next time, thanks for watching.